Jazz 147, pass west to the Victoria View and upload 3000 until established. Clear visual approach on my zero nine. West the uh, Victoria View R and upload 3000 until established. Clear to visual zero nine, Jazz 147. Jazz 147, Roger, contact Victoria Tower now 119 decimal seven. See ya. Hello again everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video we are back for another Microsoft Flight Simulator aircraft review and this time we're going to be taking a look at the Cogspur Cessna 510 Mustang. Obviously we are a little bit behind the curve taking a look at the Mustang and indeed I do have a few add-ons that I wish to catch up on. As some of you may have seen from my recent community post, the Cessna 510 was in fact the firm favourite in terms of the next product that we take a look at. Fortunate for me as I was pretty keen to take a look at the aircraft as well and I have the perfect flight lined up for us today. Obviously we're also a little bit late to the party taking a look at World Update 11, the Canada update, so we're going to be ticking that one off as well in today's flight. We are currently on the ground at Bella Coola which is one of the new handcrafted airports and we're going to be taking the Mustang up north towards Stewart. Stewart is an airport that I've wanted to visit in the sim for quite some time now, it looks to be a very scenic approach and the same is true of the departure here out of Bella Coola. Planning on carrying out a full review of the aircraft today, however once again since we're a little bit behind the curve, we're going to carry out the flight first so that those of you who wish to join along purely for the flight can do so, and we'll look at the rest of the aircraft in a little bit more detail towards the end of the video, as usual we'll finish up with my overall thoughts on the product. Today's flight is one I'm looking forward to, the Mustang looks like it should be good fun, the departure out of Bella Coola and the arrival into Stuart as I say should offer up a nice challenge, and a little bit of wintry Canadian weather en route as well for good measure. As always ladies and gents I do hope you enjoy the video, if you do please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. According to Simbury, fuel for the flight today is quite marginal so we've topped up the tanks, the aircraft is now ready to go. So let's get ourselves on board and be on our way. Okay so we just completed the external walk around of the jet. As you can see it is a pretty cold afternoon here on the ground in Bella Coola so we're now back on board the Mustang, we've closed up the aircraft door, slowly warming up. Running through our copy preparation checks then, the oxygen control valve is set to normal. That's currently an operative on the aircraft and there are quite a few switches on the flight deck which are currently an operative. We'll touch on some of those as we go. Left and right generator switches can both go on. And you'll notice there are no sounds associated with the switches. Again, that is quite consistent throughout the flight deck which is a little bit disappointing I have to say. The left and right ignition switches are both set to normal. Left and right fuel boost pumps are both set to normal. The fuel transfer selector is off. Pilot mic switch is set to headset. Ice protection switches are all off. Landing gear handle is down. Anti-skid switch is on. Passenger safety switch is off. External lights, just the nav light selected on for the time being. Cockpit and cabin temperature selectors, again currently an operative, they are set. And the same goes for the air source selector knob, currently an operative but set to both. Pressure controller switch is set to normal, cabin dump switch is set to normal, co-pilot mic switch is set to headset, ELT switch is set to arm, oxygen supply handle is in, throttles are both set to cut off, and the battery master switch can go on. So the Garmin just initialising, just the centre screen for the time being. Standby instrument switch, according to the checklist, needs to go off. There's both a standby instrument position and a battery test position, so I'm not entirely sure which position off would be there, but we'll leave it in the standby instrument position for the time being. Parking brake is set. And in gear position, we have three green lights. Cockpit lighting, just turn up the panel lighting slightly here, if anything, just for demonstration purposes. So, cockpit lighting is set. Everyone's power switch can go on. Database and chart currency is checked. Fuel quantity. We've fully fueled up the aircraft so we have 2,450 pounds of fuel on board and the tanks are balanced. ATIS we've already received. QNH is 995. We've already got that set. Wind's pretty light looking at the uh, windsock. We'll be departing off runway 23. Clearance we'll obtain later on. So running through the before start checks then. The pre-flight inspection has been completed. Wheel trocks have been removed, the cabin door is closed. Passenger briefing not required, seat belts and signs are on. External lights will take the beacon on as well now. 
Air conditioning switch is off. Cabinet cockpit fans. Again, the switch is currently an operative, so we'll leave those in the high position. They should go off at the start. Hi, Cass. Just the Peter heat caution there. So that's checked. And the battery voltage. Currently showing 25.2 volts. So the battery voltage is checked. We'll be starting the number one engine first. Or well, the left engine, so we'll hit the left starter. And monitoring the N2 there as the engine spools up. Around 20% N2 will introduce the fuel. And just coming up on 20%, so the left throttle can go into the idle detent. Good light off there on the left engine. We're looking for an N1 rise before 40% N2. And we do have an N1 indication. We do have our ITT rise. All pressure's coming up. The engine is now stable. And we'll start the number two. Ok, so we have two good starts running through the last of our before start checks. The left and right generator switches again confirmed on. Everyone's power switch is on. DC amps and volts are checked. The before taxi checks, flight controls. Uh, full up, full down and neutral. Full left, full right and neutral and on the rudder. Full left. All right, and neutral flaps will set to take off, and the flaps are set. Speed brakes are selective retracted, and just visually confirming there on the wing, speed brakes are retracted. Windshield anti ice will select on. Altimeters we have QNH2941 set on both the left and the right. Flight instruments showing 049 there on the HSI and 049 there on the compass. Ordinarily right now I'd like to set up the Garmin unit for the departure but we actually had to do that using the Sims inbuilt flight planner since I had some real issues here using the keypad to actually program in a flight plan. We'll perhaps talk more about that later on. For now they will just come out on the range and on the autopilot we'll get the flight director on coming to heading for the departure. We'll set 230, we'll be departing off runway 23 we can centre that up once we're actually on the runway itself. So just slowing that round towards heading of 230. Which we have set. And for the altitude selector here we're going to be climbing straight up to flight level 160 which is our cruising altitude for the flight today. And bundle traffic, Bonanza Golf Officer established on the uh, mid left downwind 03. And just coming up from 16, and we have flight level 160 set. So flight instruments are checked, avionics are set, CAS and PFD messages. Just the PTO heat there, we'll leave that for the time being, that comes on later on. The ready for taxi checks then, the passenger safety switch is on, external lights will take on the taxi light. And we are now ready for the taxi. Okay, so we've now got ourselves lined up here on runway 23. There's a little bit of weather coming in from the southwest, which we don't want to be departing into, but we'll continue on with our preparations for now. We can reassess the situation in just a moment's time once we're ready for the takeoff. So for the before takeoff checks, anti-ice systems. 
the wing stab anti-ice can go to auto engine anti-ice is on windshield anti-ice can go on as well passenger signs are on flaps are set for takeoff elevator trim is set for takeoff speed brakes are retracted transponder is set to out Whilst we're down here as well, worth noting we've currently got the Yankee Juliet Quebec NDB tuned up on a frequency of 325. That's the Bella Cooler NDB. And just on the PFD options, we've got bearing one there selected to ADF. The flight plan as well, initially taking us out towards Bella Coola, and again climbing up to flight level 160. So transponder is set, displays, avionics and navigation systems are set, crew briefing is complete. Vito static switch go to pitot static engine anti-ice is on windshield anti-ice is on and lights are on anti-collision light is on ICAS and PFD messages are checked and that's the before takeoff checklist complete that weather actually getting a little bit worse out to the southwest here so we'll just discuss the takeoff see how we're going after that unfortunately in the real world Mustang I believe there are detents on the throttles you can set for both takeoff power and climb power in the aircraft currently those don't seem to exist so for the takeoff itself we're just going to come straight up to full power we'll obviously have to manage the uh, the climb here and the cruise ourselves rotate speed today is 95 knots so we're looking to rotate the aircraft climbs like an absolute rocket as you'll see in just a moment's time we'll easily be getting over 4,000 feet per minute rate of climb we're going to be climbing away visually hence we need this weather to uh, budge and once we're up above 12 and a half thousand feet that'll have us clear of the terrain and then we can uh, maneuver ourselves inbound towards the NDB. So again we're just going to have to wait for this weather to shift through. Hopefully that's not going to take too long. I'll come back to you again once we are ready for the departure. And bundle traffic at all five thirty two and Mike is exiting at Bravo for hangar fourteen. And bundle traffic Bonanza Golf Oscar Juliet is down and through the active of Ground Tree. Traffic up, Papa Tango, Julia rolling, one with your three. So as you can see that weather has cleared up quite nicely now out towards the southwest. Certainly should be good enough for us to make a visual departure here off runway 23. Part brake can come off, we'll just hold the aircraft on the brakes. Coming up to 50% and one to let the engine stabilise. And take off. Again, just coming all the way up on the throttles with no detent available. And you can see that the jet accelerates incredibly quickly here. We're already up through 95, so coming back on the yoke. It seems quite a quick takeoff run to me. Anyway, we do have positive climb, the gear can come up. And I find that initially we have to pitch for around 17 and a half degrees nose up to keep the speed in check. We're just going to wait here until we're up through 1500 feet. Then we'll come back to our climb power setting and we can retract the flaps. Almost up to around 20 degrees nose up now to keep that speed back at 180 knots and up through 1500 feet. Come back to 95% and 1. Flaps can come up. And we'll just pitch the nose down. We'll let the aircraft start to accelerate here up to around 200 knots. We'll keep the speed back at around 200 knots here until we're either up through the cloud layer or up through 12,500 feet. That puts us above the terrain. So back at 95% and 1 now, around 50 degrees nose up, maintaining about 200 knots, still getting around 5,300 feet per minute rate of climb out of the aircraft. So to me the Mustang certainly feels like it's got an abundance of power, which is fairly typical for a business jet, but that takeoff run and the initial climb phase felt a little bit overpowered to me. 
That's just speculation on my part, though. I'm not entirely sure as to the true level of performance of the aircraft. Anyway, officially clear of the train here for the time being, so we'll just come on to a heading that takes us directly towards the Bella Cooler NDB around 240 degrees. Alaska 84, call Vancouver Center on 346. 346, yeah, Alaska 84. Get on the heading, we'll center up the heading bug. And we're nicely established here now in the climb, so we'll run through the after takeoff checks. Landing gear handle is up, lights are out, flaps are up, throttles are set. Again, they should come back to the climb detent, but unfortunately we don't have one. Your damper is on, anti ice will leave as is. Passenger safety switch will leave on, landing lights. Just come up from 10,000 feet, so landing lights can go off. Pressurization is set. Again, not currently really operative on the aircraft. Altimeters are set. We're staying on QH throughout the flight today. Air conditioning can go on. The after takeoff check is complete. So, again, we are picking up the Bella Cooler NDB here. You can see the bearing needle confirmed there by the flight plan. Currently showing 13 minutes en route. We'll set the course bar here as well. It's a course of 241 that we're looking for. And there's 241 set, so we're nicely on course currently. No surprises there. Up through 12,500 feet now, so we're above the terrain. We'll pitch down, let the aircraft start accelerating once again. The flight plan has us at 160, but that looks like it's going to have us bang in the middle of the cloud layer here, so we may climb a little bit higher, we'll see how we go. And as we are now nicely established in the climb, we'll go into vertical speed, get the autopilot in. I think we'll climb here up to flight level 200. That should put us above all of the cloud, out of any icing. And again, with the rate of climb available on the Mustang, that's not going to take us too long at all. So flight level 200 selected, speed still slowly increasing here, doing around 230 knots now. One thing I've really noticed about the aircraft, the wind noise is particularly loud on the aircraft, and it doesn't sound particularly authentic either. It's nice to have the additional wind noise, but in a real jet it's more of a roar as opposed to here. You can hear a bit of a howling gale, so it's quite an off-putting sound effect actually, it doesn't sound very true to life. Anyway, since we've got the flight plan in, we'll go into NAV. As I say, I had to actually use the SIMS flight planning tool here to put the routing in. Wasn't able to do that via the jet, at least as best I could tell. So the aircraft just tracking out to the left here to join the flight plan track. Obviously we've got the ADF as a bit of a backup in guidance. And it looks like 200 is still not going to quite keep us clear of this cloud, so we'll come up to flight level 220. Using vertical speed here at the moment, which means the speed is dropping. We're just trying to get above the cloud as quickly as we can, but we're going to have to reduce our rate of climb slightly here. We want to keep above 200 knots. We can just nudge the throttles up again here as well to maintain 95% and 1%. So we've got full throttle again at this point, maintaining around 93%. So we'll just keep reducing that vertical speed. Back down to around 2,000 feet per minute now on the VS. Contact Vancouver Center on 13532. So actually, up at slightly higher flight levels here now, the aircraft performance feeling a bit more reasonable. We'll keep a good eye on our nav tracking here though. It looks like we're currently parting away from our flight plan route. So far I found the autopilot to be pretty hit and miss, again pretty typical of the uh, default Sobo avionics. The aircraft has all of the same issues as you'd expect. Not really happy with that flight plan tracking so we're going to come back into heading, we'll just stay in heading for the rest of the flight if it's not going to follow the course directly for us. It's 1000 to go. Just edging in through the cloud tops here but it looks like after this particular build up we should be fairly clear of the clouds so we'll Maintain flight level 220. Just keeping that engine anti-ice on for now since we're still in the cloud layer. So coming up on our out, again you can see the capture there, very abrupt. We've captured below our altitude here as well. 
So we're just going to continue inbound here towards the Bellacoola NDB. Once we're overhead the station, we can track northwest up the coastline. We'll talk more about the arrival in Stuart as we commence the descent. It should be a pretty interesting one, a little bit similar as our departure there out of Bellacoola itself. We're going to be flying down the valley, probably having to uh, negotiate a little bit of weather on the way in. Anyway, nicely established here in the cruise now, so we'll head outside. And as I say, I'll come back to you again once we are ready to commence the approach into Stuart. Group 109, Vancouver Centre, Roger, Abbas for Davis, Bravo, descend 11000, hope altimeter 2, correction 3010, but that is more than an hour old. 11000, check, we have Bravo, Group 109. Okay. Thank you for saying, good morning, Pasco 1531, 4000, cleared 7000, direct welcome. Pasco 1531, Vancouver Centre, good morning, climb flight level 210. Climb 210, Pasco 1531. Good morning, uh, Vancouver Center, Korean Air 9045, heavy, flying by 350. Evolve Camel Point 1000, you're going to be requesting 3,500 for your three overhead, you're going to be able to use. LJ 702, Victoria Terminal, Squawk Mass 3500, North Sound approved, Victoria Altimeter is 3008. You're nearing Kelly, just how are you doing? LJ 702, you are radar identified. Okay, 702. That's 147, which one do you put in? Uh, visual 09. Roger, about the film site. Jazz 147, pass west to the Victoria of UR and up close 3000 until established. Clear visual approach on my 09. West to the uh, Victoria of UR and up close 3000 until established. Clear to visual 09, Jazz 147. Jazz 147, Roger, contact Victoria Tower now 119, decimal 7. See ya. Good morning, number 610 off the harbor through 2000, address 2.5 north south. Our Express 610 Victoria Terminal, Squawk at 3000 Southern North South approved. Victoria Altimeter is 300. So welcome back to the flight deck. We ended up climbing up to flight level 240. We've just reached our calculated top descent point, showing about 75 miles to run. 240, 75 miles looks to be about correct, so we'll commence the descent. We can initially descend down to 8,500 feet. That'll keep us clear of the terrain on the descent here, and we can negotiate the weather on the way down. Descend further once we're clear of the cloud. So we'll just get the aircraft coming down before we finish setting the descent altitude here. Ground speed, 330 knots, so we'll go for a descent rate of around 1500 feet per minute. We're aiming to fly a 3 degree descent profile here. And I'm reducing the throttles to keep the speed in check at around 250 knots. So coming back to around 77% uh, and 1 for the time being. Just descend initially down to 10,000 feet. So we have 10,000 set. Just coming slightly further back on the throttles again, just maintaining 250 knots. So we are descending, speed over the ground again, 334 knots. That's actually our TAS. Ground speed is 330 as well, so pretty minimal wind around. And again, 1,500 feet per minute should give us a uh, 3 degree descent profile here. In terms of our descent checks, pressurisation, again most of the cabin pressurisation systems are not currently modelled so we'll say that's been set. Anti-ice, we'll take the engine anti-ice on. I've noticed as well occasionally some of the switches don't seem to quite have the correct click spots there but once again the engine anti-ice is on for the descent as we come down through the cloud layer. Throttles are set as required, altimeters we can set in just a moment's time once we come through flight level 180. Landing data has been set and verified, and the landing lights will leave off till we come through 10,000 feet. So that's the descent checklist complete. Just continuing to reduce the power here as we descend. We'll keep a good eye on our distance as ever as we come down here. So coming through flight level 210, we need about uh, 63 miles to run, currently showing 64. So looking good here on profile for the time being. And that ground speed starting to come down as well as we descend. Obviously, we're reducing our true air speed. So the plan here to make our way in towards Stuart. We're actually going to peel off here and follow the course 
of the inlet out towards the airport itself. That's actually going to have us following the US-Canadian border as well, for a point of interest. For now though, we'll just stay on our flight plan track until we're actually visual with the inlet itself. And as I say, once visual, we'll work away inbound towards the airfield. We'll have to probably negotiate the weather here inbound as well. We'll find a gap in the clouds, we'll descend through that, we'll get ourselves below the cloud layer and then we can visually make our approach in towards Stuart. Just coming up on flight level 200, seatbelt signs are on. Again, no passengers down the back, so not really particularly pertinent today. And flight level 200 means we need 60 miles to run, showing 59. Looks like we are visually clear here, coming through the first cloud layer. So we'll start adjusting our heading now to uh, track the course of the inlet. Stayed in heading throughout the entirety of the flight in the end. Again, wasn't very happy with the aircraft in terms of managing our nav track. Actually, I would say the aircraft seems to be less proficient at tracking in nav than I previously recall most default Sobo aircraft being, but that may be as a result of the most recent update, for example. Back to 67% now on the M1. And shortly coming up on flight level 180, so we'll get ready to change back over to the QNH. The weather in Stuart is broadly the same as we saw coming out of Bellacoola. The QNH is uh, 2941 still. Temperatures around minus 10 degrees, pretty light winds around, so we're going to be coming in on the northerly runway. That should have us in for a straight and approach. Definitely the much easier option here with the high terrain out to the north of the airfield. Obviously still quite a bit of cloud around here, so potentially some snow showers on the way in. That's going to rather scupper us if we find visibility a bit limited on the approach. There's no instrument approach aid into Stuart, just the visual, so we'll obviously need visual conditions here before we commence the approach. Okay, down through flight level 180. So our temperatures are set. You can see the inlet now just below us off at our 12 o'clock. Looks like we've got a pretty nice break in the cloud layer here actually between us. The inlet now just below us. So we'll increase our descent rate here. Coming all the way back to idle on the power. We'll just descend to keep the speed around 250 knots. Again, no passengers on board the aircraft, so we're not too worried today about uh, passenger comfort. 4,000 feet per minute now on the descent rate. We can even nudge that up a little bit more. So we've negotiated the first cloud layer again, we just need to get down below the second. I'm inclined here to just descend as quickly as we can, we know there's a break in the clouds. We'll get below that, we'll just work our way in low level towards Stuart itself. Obviously not the most efficient way to make the approach in terms of the profile, but again, better to get below the cloud layer here whilst we know we can. And we'll keep our aircraft coming down, so we'll set 2,000 feet now. There's 2,000 on the PFD. Keep the autopilot in for the time being, so we'll just finesse our course here on the heading. Still looking good on the speed, just coming up on 10,000 feet, we'll take the landing lights on. And of course we're already below 250 knots. We can start working our way as well through some of the approach checklists, so landing data has been confirmed. Seatbelt signs are on, avionics and flight instruments are checked. Minimums not applicable today, obviously a visual approach. Fuel transfer is off. Anti-ice is set as required. We'll just leave the engine anti-ice on a little bit longer here. We'll start reducing that descent rate. Landing lights are on and we'll hold the checklist at the line there until we want to take the flaps. 
So we're just going to continue descending down the valley here. We'll put ourselves, as I say, just below the uh, cloud layer. Looks like we should be able to remain visual as we do so. One Vancouver Center, good morning. Prince George information, Delta. Um, not showing a runway. The weather is improving there. Special at a time 1516 from the auto station when calm. Visibility 6 miles in mist. Ceiling 200 broken. Temperature 32.3. Altimeter 3014. Uh, we copy the second house. Uh, the first house, you got stepped on for the issue 831. We trade 831, sorry, I missed your last comment. Say again. Uh, we got the second half of your transmission, the first half, uh, somebody stepped on you, please 831. Roger, Prince George Special, 1516, from the auto station, went calm, visibility 6 miles in mist, ceiling 200 broken, temperature 32.3, altimeter 3014. Prince George information is Delta, and uh, they're not showing a runway at this time. Okay, so we're just coming down the final stretch of the valley inbound towards Stuart, showing about nine miles to run. We'll take out the autopilot. Flight director and the yaw damper there can go off as well. Speed's back around 160 knots now, so we'll take a stage of flap. Now we'll just maintain 160 knots. We'll start the aircraft here into the descent again. Coming from eight miles, so we'll just make a shallow descent for now. Continuing with our approach checks, the CAS and PFD messages are checked. Crew briefing is complete. Take the gear down. And to come up on the throttles again to maintain 160 knots. Okay, not visual with the runway yet, but we are visual with the area, so we should be good for the approach. We have gear down three greens, speed brakes are retracted. Autopilot, flight director and yaw damper are off and the airspeed is checked. We'll just hold approach flap for now, we'll take landing flap once we're visual with the runway. Yeah, Four four coming down the four four going left downwind for three three or zero three sorry. Follow the traffic, couple of left downwind, runway 03 F4 stop. Okay, so runway in sight, speed is below one five zero knots. We'll take landing flap, and once again gear is down three greens, flaps are set, the landing checklist is complete. We'll let the speed come back towards VREF. If we need to make a missed approach, it's going to be climbing straight ahead up to 8,500 feet to clear the terrain. Unfortunately, we do have a little bit of weather there out towards the north. Do you find that the Mustang hand flies a little bit more nicely than the H-Jet overall? It's less sensitive on the controls, which is good. Still not one of the best flight models I've come across in the sim, though, by a fair stretch. You'll see there's some trees as well there, just off to the right of final approach, so we'll negotiate our way past those. We might just land a little bit long here as well to help clear the tree line. I find that the Mustang really tends to float on landing, so we'll cut the power early here. We're actually back at idle on the throttles now. Coming into the flare, you can see we're still floating here, even back at 90, 85 knots. There's touchdown come up on the spoilers onto the brakes. We'll be vacating off to the left here but we'll probably have to uh, backtrack just slightly back towards the apron. So a little bit more firmly onto the brakes now getting the aircraft slowed down. And we'll just peel off to the right again to uh, make a 180 degree turn here and backtrack the runway.
Okay, so the exit just coming up here on our right. It's a very short taxi here, pretty busy apron, so we'll just hold the offline checks until we've got the aircraft parked up. We'll come park up on the left. And we'll swing the aircraft to 180 degrees here, just so we're parked up, facing out, ready to go later on. Looks like there's a little bit more snow just coming through the area. So right turn, as I say, we'll come through 180 degrees, just using a little bit of right brake here as well to tighten up the turn. And we'll keep a good eye on our wingtip clearance. All clear. So straightening the aircraft up onto the brakes. Part brake is set. For the offline checks, the flaps can come up. Speed brakes will retract. Wing stab, the ice switch can go off. Vito static switch is off. Windshield anti-ice is off. Interestingly, spring loads back to the on position. I'm not sure whether or not that's accurate. Engine anti-ice switches are off. Landing lights are off. We'll get the anti-collision light off there as well. With shutdown checks, the part brake is set. Engine anti-ice switches are off. Windshield anti-ice is off. Passenger safety switch is off. Line lights are off, air conditioning is off, flap handle, according to the checklist, takeoff approach, so we'll come back to the takeoff approach position. Everyone's power is off, and the throttles we can move into the cutoff position. So we'll shut down the right engine first. And good shutdown there on the right. Same on the left. So we have two good rundowns, external lighting switches. Beacon can come off, we'll just leave the nav lights on. Cockpit and cabin fans, again, not currently operative. Oxygen supply handle is out. And the battery master can go off. So there you go, guys. I do hope you enjoyed our outing in the Coxspur Cessna 510 Mustang. I certainly enjoyed the flight, but I have to say I did find quite a few issues and shortfalls currently with the Mustang, so we'll obviously be covering those to finish up the video. Before we debrief, we'll first take a quick look at some of the other features of the aircraft. I think we got a pretty good feel for it during the flight. Hopefully you got a pretty good look at both the external and internal modelling and texturing. Nevertheless, just to look at a couple more details included with the product. Mustang does come with its own mini onboard tablet, as you may have noticed throughout the flight. There are a couple of nice features associated with that, some of which you'll already have seen. For example, you can select the engine covers, pitot covers, as well as chocks. You can also open up the nose cargo compartment, select a visible co-pilot on and off, visible both externally and internally. And lastly, a nice little feature for a VIP jet, you can select a red carpet out towards the aircraft, as well as a Rolls Royce there parked up in the background. Just looking at the modelling of the aircraft in a little bit more detail here, since we didn't get in particularly close during the video. Overall I would say that the modelling and the texturing of the Mustang is certainly up to typical Microsoft Flight Simulator standards. Generally speaking I do find both the modelling and texturing to be pretty good, I think the Mustang looks quite nice. There are though just one or two rougher areas on the aircraft where for example panel lines don't match up, or there are perhaps rougher edges on certain parts of the model. You can see here for example on the main landing gear and the wheel well bay, detail is certainly adequate but there are some rough edges, some lower resolution textures. So broadly speaking, personally I feel that the Mustang is broadly on a par with most of the default aircraft in the sim in terms of modelling and texturing, which ultimately of course is no bad thing. The cockpit, again, hopefully we've had a pretty good chance to look at already, but I think it certainly holds its own. Areas that I do feel are a little bit weaker in the cockpit, firstly would be the avionics. They seem to be very much default avionics, no real attempt there to customise them as far as I could tell. I gather that the 510 does indeed make use of the Garmin units in the real world, but I believe there is more customization in terms of what's displayed on the screen. I also had a strange issue with a lot of the markings in the cockpit. I found that if I wasn't using DLSS, instead using TAA for the anti-aliasing, then a lot of the cockpit text actually looked like it was dissolving on screen, which was a little bit strange. And it may well be that the issue has arisen as a result of Sim Update 10. I'm not entirely sure on that one as I haven't looked at any other add-ons post-update. As mentioned, you do also get a small customised EFB as well as a clickable checklist. The EFB options are simple but fairly decent there. Again, you can add or remove chocks, engine covers, pitot covers, as well as the red carpet, the co-pilot, and you can have visible passengers down the back. 
Finally, you can also open up the cargo door. One minor gripe there, you can't visibly remove the pilot model as far as I can tell. And similarly, you can't actually open up the main cam door there via the tablet. Instead, you have to go back and click on the door itself. Lastly, a quick look at the aircraft's night lighting, which overall I thought looked very good. There is both integral lighting fixed within the panel, which we saw during our flight. There's also a dome light and two reading lights for the pilots. Anyway, hopefully that quick tour has given you a slightly more in-depth feel as to what the product has to offer. As usual, we'll break things down into positives and negatives, starting with the negatives and working our way through to the positives. I do have to start out by saying that overall, unfortunately, there were more negatives than I was hoping and indeed expecting to see with the aircraft. I thought the Mustang looked like a really nice jet. It looked like great fun as well, and I was certainly really looking forward to the flight today, as I mentioned during the introduction. My enjoyment was unfortunately, though, somewhat tempered by some of the issues that I found during the flight. I think for me at the moment, the biggest issue I have with the aircraft is its systems modeling. There are quite a few systems and optives, certainly more than I was expecting to see given the price point. Nothing really game breaking, missing as far as I could tell, but nevertheless, again, at the 25 euro price point, I was expecting slightly more comprehensive systems. As we've already discussed, quite a few switches that weren't clickable in the cockpit. Again, I believe there should be throttle detents which weren't modelled on the aircraft. The avionics as well felt very default in nature. Personally, I can live with the default avionics in terms of the displays, but I did find that the default autopilot rather ruined my enjoyment of the jet. There we saw that the jet didn't really capture altitude, certainly levelling off quite early with a high rate of climb. Similarly, we seem to have issues there following a flight plan track. Again, it is always a little bit difficult to know whether or not these sorts of issues have crept in as a result of the recent sim update. But really at the moment, the autopilot only able to loosely get the aircraft from A to B based on the user inputs. We discussed as well an inability to be able to set up a flight plan using the aircraft's onboard controls. Worth mentioning, as always, that could be user error on my part, but I don't believe it to be. Just demonstrating to you here, for example, if we go to flight plan and we actuate the correct rotary there, it has no input on the screen itself. Whereas if we do click on direct two, you can see there that the rotary selector does actuate as it should. And indeed we can scroll and select through the various fields such that we can input the next waypoint. Similarly, as discussed, both the alpha and numeric keypads not currently functional. It's only the enter and clear keys and the rotary selectors themselves. So at the very least, I'd like to see that functionality improved as currently the aircraft doesn't feel entirely usable having to put a default flight plan in by the Sims flight planner. So aircraft systems, currently I would say a little bit of a letdown. Hopefully Coxburg will do some more work in that regard. I don't think it would bother me too much if we were looking at a 10, maybe a 15 euro aircraft, but certainly at this sort of price point, I think it's fair if one does expect more systems fidelity. Sounds were another area where I felt the aircraft was a little weak. Overall, the engine sounds are pretty decent. They're custom, so that's nice to see. But certainly a lot of default sounds quite noticeable throughout the flight. And as mentioned, a very noticeable absence of any switch or control sounds within the cockpit. As I've mentioned during many of my reviews, I do feel that sound packs are very important in creating that overall feeling of immersion. And certainly with an add-on in Microsoft Flight Simulator, I do expect to have a comprehensive sound set using WI sounds as well. Here I think we were using the legacy sound engine from what I could tell. Engine sounds themselves, as I say, generally quite nice, although noticeable from the external view. Viewing the aircraft from the front, the engine sounds are rather quiet. They do have a nice roar to them though when the jet's viewed from the rear. Wind noise we've discussed, very loud and rather inappropriate in terms of the wind noise used. It tends to sound as though there's a bit of a howling gale in the flight deck, which it certainly shouldn't. And I also noticed that you do tend to get that default Asobo rumble when putting the aircraft into a bank, which again, I don't think is typical, at least not of any jet that I've flown. So sounds and systems are really my two major negatives, a couple of more minor ones as well. Firstly, not being able to remove the default pilot model was always a little bit of a shame, particularly when you can remove the co-pilot model. Not a big issue, of course, but it does make for some nice screenshots and it seems strange not to have the functionality available. The same goes with not being able to open the aircraft door via the tablet instead of having to click on the door itself. Again, obviously not a big issue, but it's just a nice convenience to have. The documentation included with the product was also a touch disappointing. It does give you a basic outline of the aircraft systems. It also gives limitations and basic operating speeds. It was a fairly brief document though, and it really only outlined the real world details of the aircraft. It didn't actually cover the product itself. So for example, it did take me a little bit of time to figure out how to turn on the onboard EFB as the click spot itself is quite small. And again, I was rather left wondering whether or not it's actually possible to remove the pilot model from the aircraft. I couldn't find a way of doing so. 
One last thing that I also noticed in the cockpit, the view did feel to be a little bit fisheye at the default zoom level. Zooming in manually did tend to correct that, and I have noticed that with a couple of other add-ons that we looked at recently. I'm not sure why that's crept into a few add-ons of late, but again, a minor inconvenience having to reset the zoom each time you reset the view in the cockpit. Before we move on to the positives, just touching on a couple of things that I would say are rather a middle ground with the aircraft. Firstly, the FPS. With the Mustang, I was getting an FPS of around 59 versus around 76 in the default Cessna 152. So around a 17 FPS hit, which is fairly significant, but of course one would expect that to be the case with the glass screens in the cockpit. Flight model for me, again, a bit of a middle ground. As I mentioned during the flight, nothing special, but I do think the Mustang flies a little bit more plausibly than the H-Jet, for example. The aircraft felt pretty typically squirrely on the rudder during the takeoff, seemed a little bit overpowered, as I said, during the takeoff and the initial climb out. In the later stages of the climb, the performance seemed more reasonable, seemed pretty decent up at cruise as well. I have heard some mentioning that the aircraft is a little bit slow in the cruise, even with full power, but personally I didn't notice that, although we were obviously at a fairly low cruise altitude. Descent felt fine, the aircraft was very easy to slow down, no real drag required there to get the speed back. And again, the jet felt reasonable on the approach, maybe just a touch vague on the controls, certainly a little bit floaty on the landing it seemed. By and large, I have to say, at the moment, the Mustang for me feels fairly reminiscent again of a default aircraft in terms of how it handles. So unfortunately, there are a fairly long list of issues and improvements that I would like to see on the product. So hopefully it's a case of the product just being released a little bit early here, and we will see significant improvements to the Mustang going forward. Anyway, in terms of what I like about the aircraft, again, for me, the texturing and modelling holds up pretty nicely, both internally and externally. I really like the aesthetic and the design of the Mustang as a jet, so I'm really hoping that we can get the aircraft to where we want it to be. Somewhere broadly on a par with the Honda jet would be nice. The aircraft was pretty good fun to hand fly for the most part. Again, not a study level flight model, I don't think, by any means, but enjoyable. No auto throttle, but very speed stable, which is great. Very easy to maintain speed manually. And I think the 510 does offer up some potential good fun blasting in and out of various airfields. The Mustang, to me at least, doesn't come across as a low quality product. It is quite clear to see that Coxburgh have put the effort in. I liked all of the little touches and custom details that they've added. For example, the engine covers, pitot covers, chocks, visible passengers in the cabin, visible co-pilot. I gather there's also a medical setup available on the jet. Certainly not the sort of details you'd be expecting to see from a developer who didn't care. So for me, I just think it's a little bit of a case here that the product's been released too early. The jet certainly shows potential, and if you are a big fan of the Mustang, you'll probably still have some fun out of the add-on. Currently though, it would be hard to point out many areas where the Cessna 510 really excels above the competition, namely I'm thinking of the Flight FlightFX Honda Jet, and indeed the working title Cessna CJ4. I certainly hope that we see further work on the aircraft, as again, I do think that the Mustang has the potential to be a really great fun little jet. It would, in its current state, be a very reasonable product for 10, 15 euros, but it seems now in Microsoft Flight Simulator, we are expecting a little bit more for a 25 euro add-on. Anyway guys, as always, I do hope you found the review useful and of course enjoyable. If you did, please consider giving the video a like. If you want to see more content from the channel, then please consider subscribing as well. As ever, a very big thank you to my channel members and patrons for all of your support. It is hugely appreciated. I do hope that all of you are having a great day wherever you are. Take really good care and I will see you all again soon.